Well, hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live Peer Exchange discussion, Practical Strategies for Treatment of Clear Cell Renal Cell Carcinoma. Research in the field of genitourinary urinary oncology continues to provide us with paradigm-changing data in terms of how we treat our patients with systemic therapy. Recently, I was joined by my colleagues, Dr. Neera Jagarwal, Dr. Bradley McGregor, and Dr. Tian Zhang in a Twitter chat during which we discussed some of the practical questions that plague the community oncologists when treating patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. It was really an engaging discussion in which we were also joined by several other experts in the field. In today's OncLive peer exchange discussion, we're going to explore those questions further as we share the insightful comments that we gathered from both kidney cancer experts and community-based oncologists on Twitter. I'm Dr. Samantha Kumar Pal, Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research and Co-Director of the Kidney Cancer Program. I'm also a practicing medical oncologist at City of Hope in Duarte, California. Joining me today are Dr. Neer Jagarwal, who's Professor of Medicine, Presidential Endowed Chair and Director of the Genital Urinary Oncology Program at the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I'm also joined by Dr. Bradley McGregor, who's an Instructor of Medicine and Clinical Director for the Lenk Center for Genital Urinary Oncology, as also GU Network Liaison, CSO Cabinet Director at Harvard Medical School at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Finally, I'm joined by Tian Zhang, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Medical Oncology, Department of Medicine, the Duke Cancer Institute in Durham, North Carolina. Now, we have a lot of exciting things to cover today. Let's get started on our first topic, treatment of newly diagnosed disease, and some of the questions that we addressed on Twitter. Now, Tian, the first question that we actually touched on was risk stratification. Right. We thought about it a lot in the past generation of treatments we had. How are we using risk stratification nowadays? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it really panned out after we saw the Checkmate 214 data, where Ipinevo, uh, saw, we saw such a benefit of Ipinevo in the intermediate poor risk, but not so much in the favorable risk patients. And so based on that, our NCCN guidelines really changed to reflect the, the importance of risk stratification. And so, uh, you know, in our clinics, we use uh, IMDC risk criteria to risk stratify our patients and kind of get a sense of who has, you know, favorable risk disease versus intermediate and poor, more, you know, guarded prognoses. And uh, in turn, using those um, figure out who should be treated with what what types of treatments up front um, and it's so critical now as we're looking at more phase 3 data um, to to think about these clinical um, uh, factors as we're, we're selecting treatments um, so so we know the IMDC criteria are, are pretty much you know a list of clinical criteria um, that we teach our fellows all the time and they're um, their criteria of you know, less than a year from nephrectomy to treatment, uh, Kardofsky performance status, and then um, laboratory values that really reflect, I think, the inflammation of uh, the disease process. So the neutrophilia, anemia, and thrombocytosis are all sort of inflammatory markers. And then the hypercalcemia sometimes can be a marker of bone metastasis, which we know is a poor prognostic, prognostic marker. Interesting. That's a great summary of the HANG criteria. Now, Brad, let me ask you, I've talked to a lot of community-based oncologists who say, look, those are impressive criteria, but I'm just going to look at the patient. If they're in a wheelchair, they're poor risk. If they're not, they're good risk. Tell us about that. Do you really go through the criteria in detail so with every I, patient? I think with the advent of the new data, I think it's become more important to look at the risk criteria in more detail. You know, before it was something they used to offer a prognosis, and people may say, well, I can offer just as good a prognosis by looking at the patient, but now we actually have data that suggests that which treatment you choose depends on the risk classification. And when you start thinking about that, I think it's important that you can't really eyeball a risk stratification. You really need to look at all the factors that go into play, and that should be one of the factors you use to determine what the best treatment is going to be for your patient. I, I tend to agree with you. You know, what's interesting is that, you know, on Twitter we had a pretty healthy dialogue around good risk disease, and Tian, you alluded to the NCCN criteria and how they play a role now in selecting therapy. You know, Neeraj, one of the hotly debated items in our Twitter chat was what to do for good risk disease. Is there a clear answer there? What's your practice? Yeah, so first of all, building up on what Tian said, a few years ago, we are just using these criteria for prognostication, telling the patients like how much time the patient has, uh, statistically speaking. But then the Checkmate 214 trials showed us that these, it was a first, in my view, first validation of those criteria and how biologically relevant they were from our practice perspective. When the, in the good risk patients, a VEGF-TKI clearly was superior to the combination checkpoint inhibitors 
as far as overall survival, as far as pro progression-free survival and response rates are concerned. Even though overall survival tends to be superior in both arms, but response rates were so drastically improved with sunitinib compared to ep nevo combination, even the progression-free survival, survival. So I think, in my view, this is a different disease category or different disease subtype right. within the clear cell type. We talked a lot about, on the Twitter chat, we talked a lot about how those favorable risk patients may, you know, because of this data, be more, you know, dependent on the angiogenesis sort of mechanism and blood formation, uh, blood vessel formation, and how that is very critical. I mean, these patients really respond more to the VEGF um, targeting TKIs more than they do to the immunotherapies. And so, um, you know, on the Twitter chat, we we showed that um, the breakout of the responses um, based based on um, you know, favorable risk versus intermediate poor risk. And I think you're absolutely right, Niraj. You know, we see this really great improvement in um, you know, response rates for sunitinib in the favorable risk patients. And so you know, in that favorable risk patients up to Checkmate 214, we were still um, using you know, single agent um, you know, VEGF-TKI um, th therapies.